¿Saben qué van a comer mañana? Ni idea. La semana que viene. Good morning, everyone. Those are some tough images, and this is a tough conversation that we're about to have. I'm Juju Chang with ABC News Nightline, and on the stage with me are two fierce and fearless women who've thrown themselves heart and soul into this crisis because, in some way, they have no choice. Dr. Astrid Kantor is active in the crisis, and to her right is a medical student nearly almost acting as Dr. Federica de Villa. Thank you both for joining us on Thank this stage all the way from Venezuela. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. First, paint a picture for us using statistics and imagery of what you've seen of what's going on right now in Venezuela. Astrid, you start. Well, um, right now we have a generalized crisis, okay? We have 75% of our hospitals don't come with the best basic supplies to provide health care for people. Um, the crisis is so generalized that it will affect you regardless of whether you have a mild flu or you're dealing with HIV, you're dealing with TBC, you're dealing with uh, the, all of these diseases that we haven't seen in Venezuela for such a long time, like diphtheria, malaria, measles. So it will affect you, regardless of your socioeconomic status, regardless of your pol political beliefs, uh, whether you go to a private or a public hospital, the crisis will affect you. We are in crisis mode. Federica, yeah. give us a sense of what you're witnessing. First, I want to thank you for having me here and for taking into account and then into consideration Venezuela's crisis because I really believe there needs to be a voice that tells the story of what's going on. We don't really have a press over there and it's very important for the world to know what is going on. And uh, I would like, like to start um, telling that I'm really sad that my co-founder and co-director with whom I started this project, uh, that we never thought that it would come this far, Daniel Aliendo, she has worked with me since day one. Actually, today, she is doing an, an, an intervention in one of the poorest communities in Caracas to help the people that don't have any access to health care to have a diagnosis and to have a treatment. So I would like to ask you to give her a round of, of, of applause because she deserves it. Federica, you were a first-year medical student in 2014 when the protests first struck. It was you and four other medical students who ran out into the streets to help. And yet last year, when there was a second, seemingly more violent upheaval, Green Cross rose up to help. Tell us about how you founded Green Cross. Well, on, two, on 2014, uh, it was led by, by Hipólito García and Asdrúbal Moreno, Asdrúbal Moreno who have... Um, shamelessly left, left the country. And all of the doctors that were with us, the medical students that worked with us in that time, have almost all of them left the country to do their masters and degrees in other countries. I think the looking, statistic is like 40% of yeah, medical yeah, students, right, right, have left. Looking for better opportunities. Um, then, at that time, we were like 40 people helping in the streets. But it was nothing like 2017. On 2017, Daniela and I reactivated this team. On the first day that we went to the streets, we were four people. We were four medical students that went to a pharmacy, bought whatever we could find that you cannot find much in Venezuela, like gauze and alcohol, and that was what we carried on our, on, on our backpacks. And you can see the green cross up there. That's yeah. you guys in action. Yeah, uh, that we carried on our backpacks. And a month later, we were 250 people between medical students and 
doctors who joined our project and went to the streets, went into the, the riots inside of it on the first row to help the injured that were, that were... Tell us about some of the wounds that you were seeing, because you were saying that the first round was more like rubber bullets in the extremities, but the second time around it was more violent. In 2017 or... In 2017, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the violence level on 2017 rose up amazingly. We started, at the beginning, we saw the, like this rubber bullets on the hands, extremities, a lot of tear gas. But that rose up to the level of we having to see people as our, our own age or even younger kids, kids, death dead in front of our eyes. And in, in a lot of cases, we were able, thanks to our doctors that were there with us, and they, that became like a, a part of school. We were learning on the streets. Thanks to those doctors, we saved a lot of lives. But in some cases, we couldn't. And it was the worst part of the thing, that you were watching a human being with, a, with dreams, with a future, with a family, that had parents, that had siblings, and they just lost everything because of expressing what, what they wanted to say, to raise their voice and say, I'm not, I, I will not tolerate what is happening here. Be because of the, I hear applause. I can tell people want to applaud for that comment, that's for sure. Let's focus in, Astrid, on uh, maternal mortality rates, because okay. they are often the canary in the coal mine in terms of what's going on in a medical system. Well, yeah, it's the first indicator that something is going bad with your healthcare system, and it tells a lot. Um, mortality, maternal mortality rates are now the highest in Latin America. They are the highest, highest they have ever been in my country in the past years. In the once very prosperous country of Venezuela. Exactly, we are the country with the largest oil reserves in the world, and yet our people are dying of completely preventable causes. Uh, we have had diphtheria cases, measles cases, just because um, the government does not provide proper vaccination for children. And you're seeing mothers who are incapable of nursing. Yeah, because they are so malnourished, they cannot nurse their, their, own, their own babies, their own children. And also, like, I have seen, I have witnessed women carrying their young children, their small, month-old babies, through the border to get to Colombia, just to get the children vaccinated. Because a mother will always get, will care for her child. So if she cannot get the vaccine she needs in Venezuela, she will cross the border with a child to make sure her child is vaccinated. So they will get those for free at Colombia, but they cannot get it at Venezuela. Federica, give us a sense of the conditions of the malnourishment that you're seeing and also the deprivation in the hospital, because not only are there no supplies, sometimes there's no running water, no power. Well, um, after the riot stopped, we like, realized that we had an organization full of power, full of people that had the most positive energy, that wanted to help, that wanted to construct the country that we want to, that we want to see. And that is why we started doing interventions in the poorest communities, uh, the ones that have no access to healthcare at all. Thanks to the international community, we've been able not only to give them diagnosis, but to give, me the, to give them the treatment that they won't find in Venezuela. And if they find them, they won't be able to pay it because nobody has money. Everybody is, is like in lack of money at this moment. It is very expensive to have medicine and it, is, it has gone through a black market right now. So in these communities, we have seen how deteriorated the health of the people is. And this is of course consequences of no water, no hygiene, they don't have access to food, this, all of this makes your body less capable of getting a, dis a, a disease that's obvious. And we've seen diseases that are so easy to treat and we are unable to do anything because we don't have the resources. So we would like to ask the international community to keep on helping us because that's the only way that we can keep helping these people. Uh, and, uh, just one example, a treatment for malaria is two dollars and five cents. With two dollars and five cents, 
we can treat a patient that has malaria and could die of it. And so you've asked for people to at least acknowledge that you have a Venmo account for Green Cross and you, because it's very difficult to get funds channeled in the right direction. Yes, it, had, it, it has been very difficult. Um, after the riot stopped, people got, got like, lost their motivation and stopped helping. But we really need you to do so, so we can keep helping these people. We have a Venmo account. It's uh, called Green Cross, as it sounds, at Green Cross. We also have a PayPal, Green Cross, and we have an account in Bank of America for the uh, Green Cross Corporation here in the United States that we can, I can share with you, with you whenever we get out of here. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they will be sitting so, here and listening to all the panels, but yes, they will the, want to talk to you. Yes, of, at the end of the conference, I can give you all the information. If, one, if what, each one of you donates right now, take yourself an out and donate $1 to our Venmo account, you are making a difference for a child or for a mother or for a father or, or a cousin or someone who is really suffering in Venezuela. Astrid, you are working in Merida, which yeah. is a more rural area. Tell me about some of the more exacerbating problems that you have from transportation to power. Well, um, historically, people from more rural areas had to worry about how to get to larger hospitals in the bigger cities to get specialized health care. Nowadays, that's the least of our problems. To put this in context, I will uh, give a, a little example. Let's just pretend uh, or imagine you are the mother of a small child who just got sick. Your child might have pneumonia, your child might have diarrhea. You will arrive to the hospital and the doctor will say, well, yeah, I have to admit your child, he's really sick, but first I need you to get all of this. And then he will hand out a list of the things you need to go and buy. The medical supplies. The medical supplies. You will need everything, everything. You need to bring to your own syringes. Thing. Exactly, you need to buy your own syringes, you need to buy your own cotton, you need to buy your own rubbing alcohol. There is nothing, absolutely nothing at the hospitals, nothing. And let's just say you went through all of the pharmacies, you can walk to 15, 20 drugstores just to find the antibiotics you need because we don't have any antibiotics. And then let's just say you find them, you realize the price is 10 times what you make a month, so right. you cannot afford it. I was so what, what people do nowadays is that they go to Twitter, they go to Instagram, and they will go like, hey, I need this medicine for my daughter, I need this medicine for my, for my son. And then people go like, well, I happen to have that medicine. Um, I need rice. I need food. So I will make an exchange. I will give that medicine to you, and you will give me some rice. You people are bartering some, food people rations are bartering for food for, ra food rations for medicines. And that's the way we cope with these this, this issues. That, that's the black market I was talking about. And yesterday I was having a chat with Astrid and we were talking about how in hospitals right now the only thing that the patient gets is the knowledge of the doctor because we have nothing to work with, mm. nothing. We daily, me as a medical student, I daily see patients die because we don't have medicine. With, from preventable diseases exactly. that could easily you can save their them lives. So right. easily. Astrid, I, I hate to be <clears throat> bringing up such painful uh, memories, but you said you had to take a leave of absence because of one particular patient. Um, yeah, so I, I, I work on, on a pediatrics ER. That's what I like. I've always, you know, dedicated after I got away to the care of children. And there was this one time when I just got on my, on my shift and then I see, you know, uh, Dr. Gielli, and I'm like, hey, what's going on? So I, I just get to the, to the ICU, the, pediat the pediatrics ICU, and I see this child over there. Um, he was about eight months, uh, I believe, but he looked like he was two months old. Like a newborn. Like a newborn. He was so malnourished, uh, barely hair on, on his scalp. He lost his uh, hair. He, he had lost all of his hair, pretty much, and his mother was crying, but she was baffled, like her face. I would never forget her face. She could not believe that her child was that sick. She was a bit still in denial, and then when I came to ask her what, what she was feeding the child, she said, oh, I gave him some, uh, some, some milk. Uh, you know, they dilute the milk, and they add some of the rice, uh, rice flour to it, and that's it. That was the food that child was getting. So he was so malnourished. Like, the look on that mother's face, because she goes like, hey, I have six other children. I cannot be here because who's going to take care of the other six children? 
Um, and she doesn't know how to feed any of them. She couldn't feed any of them properly. She was just making the best with what she had. And that's, that's happening on a daily basis on every of our hospitals. Federica, well, both of you, let's talk a little bit about family planning, because you mentioned food rations. And the statistic that struck me is that it took a month of food rations to buy some condoms. So it's literally that kind of trade-off, not to mention family planning policies by the government that make it even more difficult. Well, the thing is, we don't have family planning from the government. It's, it's there, it's written, but it's not happening. Um, so you will have to sacrifice many things in order to eat. Um, as a woman, you cannot afford a uh, woman ha woman's hygiene products. So of course, buying a condom, you go like, hey, do I buy this condom or do I get some food? Of course you will get the food. It's, it's common sense. You told me backstage you're packing your suitcase home full of... <laughs> yeah. Um, tell, tell the audience what you're packing. Yeah, um, so basically, hygiene, f female hygiene products, it's like a... Uh, on a bad situation right now in my country because most women can't afford to buy a pad. I know it, pa it pains me to say so, I know it's an awkward subject, people don't like to talk about it, but these are our basic rights as women. And um, when, you, when you are not able to make a decision on what pad you want to wear this month, uh, that's your individual freedom that's been, you know, um, that's been neglected if you can not have the individual choice of what you want to do when the, your period comes. I mean, of course, you cannot make decisions on a larger scale if you cannot make just that tiny decision. You know, it's, it's seriously bad. Thank you for that. But you want to say something? By the definition of the United Nations of Human Rights, in Venezuela, we don't have the right to live, we don't have the right to health care, and we don't have the right to eat food. That is how harsh the situation is. And we have this team of doctors that were on the streets, that went to the riots, that were there on plain side, on the front line. And that, of course, had consequences. Seeing people dying in front of you, people who have a future, people who have family, a lot of our members have PTSD right now post-traumatic stress disorder. It is not easy to watch your own people die daily. And then in the communities, being there, knowing what they have, knowing their illness, knowing they cannot eat, and not being able to give them medicine because that one medicine we haven't gotten from outside the country, that is heartbreaking. Yes, it, it is. is heartbreaking. I know everyone here today is heartbroken to hear your stories and are so grateful that you're sharing them with us. Thank you, Federica. Thank you. I know it's therapeutic for you on some level to blog. Yeah. And you are <laughs> blogging for the Caracas Chronicles. Caracas Chronicles, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about why that is in some ways a dangerous act and being here on this stage is a bit of a peril for you. Um, well, <clears throat> you know, in Venezuela, there are many things we cannot do without a risk of losing our freedom. Speaking up is one of them. Um, just uh, a few months ago, um, you know, the government keeps saying, like, they're a feminist government, and they're pro-women's rights, and they, you know, they're pro-humanized labor. And then some months ago, um, some, uh, some people at a hospital, just like Federica, you know, young students trying to, to, to finish med school, took a picture of the conditions that women were given uh, birth in, the women who were in labor. I don't know if we have the picture right there. Mm -hmm. um, um, so yeah, that, that picture got taken and it got posted to social media, you know, to denounce the situation that this was the situation that women were on. You imagine giving labor in that situation. How cruel is that? That's not what any woman deserves. So the people who took this picture and posted, you know, got, uh, got put up in jail because they, they denounced this. So of course, whenever you denounce anything that's going on in Venezuela, you're an, at, at risk because the government does not want you who's sitting there to know what's going on in my country. The government is in denial. The government denies there is a crisis. The government denies there's people dying because of it. They do not want you to know that these are the conditions we are living in. These are the conditions our women are in. 
they don't want you to know that. So whenever you speak up, you might lose your freedom. You might be put in prison, and many people have done so. Um, also, like academia, like people at universities and colleges are at risk of losing their freedom just for speaking up. And it's and happening every day. To add something to that, not just the picture of how is she giving labor. There is no anesthesia. No women who go to a hospital, a public hospital in Venezuela, can get an epidural. Yeah. And can thing. get an epidural. There's no anesthesia. There's no, There's no anesthesia. They do it naturally without having, having all that pain that you can prevent so easily. So what pains me is that the government you know, fills its mouth saying, oh, we're a feminist government. And so to the extent that you're risking your personal safety by shining a light, I think we here in the audience would like to help you shine that light. So you're saying the Caracas Chronicles, this English language yeah. blog is vital. It's really vital. I mean, we run on people's uh, donations. We run on people's collaborations. Um, it's independent journalism. Uh, I compel all of you to, you know, get on the site and donate as much as you can. Uh, we are making efforts to make people aware of what's going on because just writing down a blog, you know, I saw this happening and I'm denouncing this. It's a subversive act. It's considered subversive in my country. So the fact and that sitting on this stage is this a stage, subversive act. A subversive, oh, a subversive, ugh, I'm sorry, a subversive act. Uh, just that the fact that I'm here and I'm speaking up and I'm saying all of these things are happening in my country is a subversive, subversive act. So our freedoms are at stake just because we're sitting here. We have uh, three precious minutes left. Mm -hmm. Let me let you have a final thought. Tell us where you think this is going and how we can help and we'll let you, Federica, finish it out. Um, so there, there is, it's really important for me to say that I come from a dictatorship. People don't say that enough. There is a dictatorship in my country right now. The regime does not want you to know what's going on. So what it's so important for all of us is just to spread the word, to be aware that this is going on. And especially with this event, and I, I'm so grateful to Tina Brown and to Women in the World because just the fact that I'm standing here is a lot because all of you are getting, you know, to know these stories, to listen to what's going on, and you don't have to go look at another continent. Venezuela is right there. It's just five hours on a plane from where we are right now. It's in the same continent. These people are dying because they don't have basic medical supplies. So I just want to leave it really clear, crystal clear, that cancer does not wait, HIV does not wait, Parkinson does not wait, and people are dying of these diseases. And we are getting diseases that we haven't seen in such a long time in Venezuela, like diphtheria, like malaria, like measles, that could be just prevented by putting a vaccine. And that I also feel nothing is going to change unless the government changes. I don't want to talk about politics because I'm a doctor. I believe in saving lives. What matters to me are human lives and saving them. But uh, once I say that, I have to make sure, like, leave it out there that as long as the government does not change, we won't be able to see a change in our health system because the government has had chances to make this right and doesn't want to make it right. It keeps on being in denial. The government does not acknowledge there's a current crisis going on. The government is like, oh no, we're fine. And as long as the government does not acknowledge we have a crisis, there's little to be done. So as long as we spread awareness, we put pressure on our government to finally come out and admit we are having problems and we're having a crisis and people are dying. To complement that. To complement that, I would like to say that the humanitarian aid is urgent in our country, is urgent, but it's not going to be the solution to this problem. Um, we need you to keep listening, to keep in touch, to keep helping us, because on our own, we will, we will lose our people. Our people will die. And that is what, why I am so proud of having these two flags here today. I will help you. which I'm proud of, that represent us. So please keep on helping us. Keep it up. Thank you very much.